Uh, good afternoon. We're a little bit late, starting, but nevertheless, uh, today we have Harry Di Ferrari, one of our distinguished professors, and I have the pleasure to introduce him. So just a few, you know, typical statements. Harry got his undergraduate engineering degree from the Catholic University in Washington in 1959. Probably, except for Arthur and myself and a few, most of you weren't born and don't, you know. <laughs> so, and then he went on to get his master's degree at MIT in 1961. And from there he went back to Catholic University in, to get a doctorate in engineering in 1966. But there are a few things about Harry that I would say most of you don't know, uh, at least the ones that haven't been here as long as I have and some others like John and so on. Um, actually in 1963, Harry was involved in the search for the USS Thresher which was one of the submarines that uh, sank initially unexplained off the Massachusetts coast. And so he worked there for a private contractor and uh, helped to look for the submarine. He also is known as the person who adapted pseudo-random M sequence pulse compression techniques Use and use this in underwater acoustic. That was something really novel, novel at the time of doing pulse compressions. And part of it, you could put more power into the pulse by compressing it, and it could also travel further. And then you could also sort of encrypt it with uh, ways that no one else could spy on you. And part of this was significant because, you know, as an acoustician, as many others uh, after World War II, most of them worked in anti-submarine warfare, and the big thing was, you know, the Russian submarines, you all know about Hunt for Red October, you know, there's a Sosus line, which is basically between Britain and Iceland, there was uh, uh, basically a, um, a tripping line that if a uh, Russian or Soviet Union submarine would go through there, you know, they would know, and obviously that will alert other things at the time. Nevertheless, um, Harry came to um, Miami or the Rasmus in 1967, and he's going to talk about this and start there, started there as a professor, and um, he worked then for more than four decades on ONR sponsored field research uh, with uh, underwater acoustic signals and he carried out back then probably experiments continuously in the Atlantic, Pacific, the Arctic and even in the Mediterranean. Um, but also what Harry has which is unique, there's no one else in this country is Harry got in 1990 the U.S. Navy's Distinguished Naval Educator Award. That award has been given only one, once, and it has been to her. Only once in acoustics. They, uh, uh, they gave it out in other fields, but I got the only one <laughs> <Not> in my <laughs> field. <laughs> so, on a personal note, um, I think I wouldn't be here if my paths wouldn't have crossed with Harry. <laughs> Sometime in the late 80s, one uh, Mel Briscoe, one of the ONR program manager, put me on a surface reverberations committee with Marshall Orr, and I was the only non acoustician in that committee of all, you know, Harry, uh, Bagaro, Ira Dyer, you name it, all of these guys were there, and I was supposed to help them to improve their. Uh, rough surface scattering uh, description. And this was just at the time when I built, we built our first ACES bar buoys, which were built as a result to on 
to try <coughs> surface skimming missiles, so we want to understand electromagnetic ducting on the air side, but it also was useful to make these kind of measurements on the, um, on the water side. So Harry said to me, oh, why don't you come down to us? We're looking for someone like you. And then in November of 1990, I started here at Rasmus and been here ever since. So, there we go. Thank you. I am going to talk today about, it's supposed to be about acoustics. I'm going to talk about research and also the academic, academic programs we had. And it's been a, a difficult, difficult trip, I can tell you. Uh, <laughs> uh, is that a long first of all, before I came here, I had no intention of ever going to graduate school or, or coming uh, doing research for a career. I wanted to be an engineer. I graduated in 1959 with a BE degree, and I got drafted. So the first thing's going to happen to me, I'm one day, they say, well, you got 90 days, we're going to call you up. Don't go anywhere. So I, I applied for a job at a, a consulting com company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with all the MIT people. And it's an engineer's assistant. And I went in for an interview, and they hired me, and they explained to me that a problem they were working on was a jet engine that wasn't meeting specifications, and they had to find out how to uh, machine the input passengers to have it give the right uh, torque speed curve at the end. Three engineers working on it, they'd all done part of this problem, and uh, they, they, they didn't all fit together. They were way behind schedule. I went home that night, and I got lucky. I, I set up a set of differential equations for the flow and the limit of things, and I solved them, and I come up with a set of algebraic equations, it's solved for the torque and speed as a function of the input path. I went in the next day, you know, a young guy, first job, first day in the job, and I said, hey, you guys think of this? And I showed this to him. And the head of the project, I'm really excited. He said, you might see that. I took this work and studied it for a couple hours. And come with me. Went down to the chief engineer of the company. He went in there three, four hours. They're going over this. And they come up and said, well, we're going to give you a raise. <laughs> Now, this was not a big deal because I was going to pay a dollar and a half an hour. <laughs> up to two and a half an hour. Okay, but that was a big deal back then. And we got an office for you. And uh, uh, the uh, guys that have been working on this, one of them was going to follow up on your model. He's going to bring you his results. You check it out, make sure he does it right. Okay. So there I was, you know, I was situated. I had a secretary in an office instead of being in the back room running a desk calculator for this guy. Well, one of the principals of the company was the dean of the engineering school at MIT, and he heard about this. And he said, I want to meet you. So I went over there one day, and, uh, and he said, how would you like to go to graduate school? I said, I can't. I said, I'm out of debt, and uh, you know, I'm going to get drafted. I said, oh, no. I said, I got this. Look, here's what we're going to do. He said, I got you out of debt. I just joined the forum, and uh, we're going to work with this guy here. And you got a full scholarship and sign this. It all worked out. So I was admitted to graduate school without ever applying for it in the master's program at MIT of all places. I had a wonderful time there. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I got through there. This is a, one of two things that got me to Miami. And the second thing is I took a job at the, at the, uh, uh, at the Navy Research Lab called David Taylor Model Basin, mm -hmm. on working on research ships. Okay? And uh, what I learned there is that the Navy had huge amounts of money spending on, on acoustics, and they didn't have enough people, and they had money in uh, this thing called SOSIS, and, and these were Said submarine sounds like a significant fraction of the GDP of the entire country was being spent in there, and they were understaffed, and it was all classified. So I met a guy there named Marvin Lash, come up to me, he said, I've heard about you. He said, look, I, I want to sponsor 10 people to get a PhD in underwater acoustics, full, full scholarship, and I'd like you to be the first. And I said, well, I can't. I'm, I'm getting married in Miami, and I have to get out there. I'll be down there in June. Maybe when I come back, I'll take a course and see what's like me. And he said, oh, look, I sponsor programs. And I'll have them hire you. And then, I can, then I can pay your transportation, and I can give you a living a lot of it, and you go down there and see if you like. When you come back in the fall, start this program. Well, I said to my wife, uh, to be there, I'm like this crazy guy. <laughs> and anyway, I couldn't turn it down, and I was bought and paid for it. Then I was, came down here in, in 1963. Then I went back, and I completed my PhD, and uh, I had three children in uh, uh, 1967. Uh, I came back here to, to Miami. So that's, a, that's how I ended up at, here and doing this stuff. And, uh, oh. Now, the Cold War years, the Navy's top priority was anti-submarine warfare. And they had unlimited resources. Uh, they had two things, a submarine silencing program, which is quiet the U.S. submarines. And this thing called SOSIS, I'll tell you what that is in a second. Uh, 
it was a critical shortage of people in, in, acoustic, in acoustics. So I, you know, I knew this was going to be a, a great, great field to, to, to get into. And, uh, let me see here. All right, so this is this is the North Atlantic here, and these docks were SOSA stations. They were listening stations. Okay, and then what they were doing is listening for Russian submarines and tracking them. Uh, okay. And, and uh, there was other ones, uh, mirror image of this in the Pacific. Now, this started out as a so far listening station. What it was for is if a plane, a uh, military plane crashed out here, they had the sus charges. And when it sucked down to some level in there, uh, it would explode and it would set out a pulse. And they would hear it in here and they would, would uh, then be able to triangulate and find out where this guy was. So that saved a lot of pilots' lives. And it was in commercial airlines until the 90s until one of them exploded in the plane. So uh, the, the plane managed to land all right, but then they checked it all out, and they found out that the fuselage had been expanded by one inch from this explosion. Oh it contained God. it, but you know, it held it together. So then they took them out of place. They had a GPS then, so they didn't really, really need all of that stuff. So and it, what, what this evolved into was a thing called, it was a huge uh, hydrophone arrays, like high underwater telescopes of sound, where you could look out and track Russian submarines. And, and uh, it was all analog technology from the 50s. And for example, this is a seamount, which the tip of which is Bermuda. And, and so what they had is these hydrophones laid out along the side here. This is just a uh, schematic. And then they would come up there, they could listen up there. And it was strictly all analog stuff, 50s technology. Teledeltos paper, burning these images. They could get the spectrum of the submarines in each of these beads. They had some old Navy chief would walk around there with a cup of coffee and eyeball on there to see if there's a submarine, whether it was a whale making the sounds, you know. And they could, they could track submarines. And this went on for a number of years. Okay, that was called Project Jezebel. Now, what happened here is that uh, there was a problem, a program ended up in Miami called Mimi. And when I got down here in 63, the summer of 63, it was just me, it was just Miami part of it, okay? The same guy, Marvin Lasky, that got me involved in, he was, had funded John Steinberg. He retired from Bell Labs, and he was the head of Project Jezebel, which was SOSIS. And uh, he had uh, this group with him, about 20 people, who were doing all this analog installations of these systems. And uh, at the time, uh, they were working on something big, which they didn't tell me about, but uh, I, I kind of gathered from what I could see. And what they had over there is off of Bimini, they'd done an ambient noise experiment, had some data. And they had a, a, a television camera underwater and coming into the breathing lab. They had hydrophones in there. Now, today, you know, a television camera, you put your phone in there and you can do this stuff to record. Then it was a full blown studio television camera with pan and tilt motors and everything else. And they managed to get this thing out there in the water, put it in a big glass housing. And, they were, and the idea was they were going to turn on the lights at night and they were hearing all these sounds and get pictures of all these fish and sort up which fish were making what sounds, because some of these fish were interfering with the sosis arrays. And making too much noise, they didn't work. So they wanted to know what this was. And it was very, it was a great lot of fun. But when they turned it on, the, 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 the sounds were like a soundtrack from a, from a Tarzan movie. You know, it's all this jungle, it sounds like jungle, sound, all these different fish. There were all these different fish. Every other kind of fish in the world was there. Was big, you couldn't tell which fish made what sound. They never did resolve it, you know, but, but it was still a lot of fun. <laughs> so <laughs> that was uh, that was my first summer. I knew I liked Miami. Then I, I stayed down here uh, until went back and uh, oops, what happened here? Hold on. Okay. Uh, let me see where I am. Okay. Uh, now. The, the state of knowledge at the time for, for underwater acoustic for transmission was that, that uh, every ship, ship to ship measurements was the only thing we had, and everything was moving. Hydrophones were swinging around, ships were going up and down. And so the phase between the transmission was totally random. And the theory was ray theory, and there was always uh, uncertainty in where these rays turned exactly. If you kind of model it with the ray theory, you got a thing called ray chaos, which predict random phase. So everybody, uh, the theory and the, and, the, and the experiments matched, and everybody thought that you know, phase was totally incoherent. You couldn't do anything with it. You were you were just stuck with this. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is how rate theory works, by the way. I want to tell you just a little bit about this. I don't want to make this too technical. But uh, if you wanted to find out what the what the sound pressure was transmitted, that's the by the way that's the rate wave equation. People say that more effort is made solving that simple looking equation than any other equation of physics. 
<laughs> and one way to do it was to track the normal to the wavefront, a high frequency approximation. And we'd shoot all the rays out from here, every direction, and you'd pick out the ones that hit the receiver. You track them the refraction by the sound speed profile through the ocean. Okay? And, and you did that, it gave you wonderful intuition. You saw where the sound went and what the travel time was, and you could compute the, the uh, uh, for different arrivals. You could add them all up to get the sort of receiver. It was very slow, but it was not a safe. Now, when they tried to push this a little bit and put fluctuations, internal wave, fine structure in there, it, the rays went chaotic. A little bit of a shove in one direction, and we did a different set of things to go shooting off at some weird way. And there was a field that you could study, ray chaos, for a while. And, and uh, uh, I had a, one time I reported some results, it's remarkable coherence I found in some arrivals. And some guy gets up and he says, uh, uh, our latest calculations uh, uh, from ray theory uh, have proven conclusively that uh, uh, you cannot possibly be measuring this degree of coherence that you are. So he says, we can only assume that you're falsifying the data. <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth is that the theory was just in the equations and, and not in the ocean. It was part of the ray approximation. And for a long time, people didn't know that. And they had this field of ray chaos that you went to and publish papers and make a living at. And they were just total nonsense. So that's the way, that's the, way the understanding was at the time. So theory and experiments were actually we were ignorant and uh, happy in our ignorance. So what Steinberg wanted to do, with wonderful intuition, is he wanted to come out here and, and uh, we put a, a source in off the Fowey Rocks lighthouse. The Fowey Rocks was out the lighthouse out here, still out here. Big, powerful source, and transmit across the Florida space over the river. And this was going to be like an imitation of a Sosis site. So you're not going to study, hold everything fixed. That was a wonderful part of the tuition. The stick, I mean, hold everything fixed out here, and then if everything happens, it has to be because of the fluctuations of the ocean. And now we can. So this is, was just starting to get underway there at, at, uh, at around this time when I first got, got there. And, and uh, between the time that I came in 73, they got this all running. Now, here was the source, a huge package, 30, 30 feet high, the big source of a quarter wave reflector on the outside, 196 degrees, 400. It's all come back into Fire Rocks Lighthouse, which was man at the time. Then one of the cable all the way up there cut into the lab. Here. So you could put the signals in from up here, wonderful. Wonderful system. It's still there, by the way. If you love diving, I'd be off the power of rush and see the remnants of a big aluminum frame that used, used to be there. And they, they turned this thing on, <coughs> and uh, you list for it in Bimini, they had the same kind of associates listening stations and these narrow band filters and cell and, and sandborn recorders. And you could sometimes you could hear it, you really it was six, uh, it was zero dB, it, it was not above the noise. Well, this is a major crisis. They spent all this money, and it was a huge amount of money. O and R was very upset. Uh, it was a man at O and R by the name of Phil Stockton. He had funded a guy named Ted Burtzall from the University of Michigan. Ted was doing theoretical work. He was in bed of a rock curve, where you can see operation curves in detection theory. He funded them for years, and he said to Ted, "Look, uh, go to Miami and get those guys 60 D a processing game. I don't write me a proposal." <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> true. So. So Ted, <laughs> Ted came down here. It, you, know, you, have to, you have to understand, this was before digital. Everything was analog. There wasn't any digital stuff. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't do it. There wasn't even desk calculators. I mean, I mean. So he comes down, he comes up with this guy, a phase coherent modulation, which digitally is very simple. You sample the signal at four times the frequency, and you add and subtract the things in a certain way, and you come out with the phase of the amplitude of the signal. It's a wonderful, simple algorithm for digital work. And he built a circuit board to do this. Put it online over there, Bimini. And he was able to separate out the phase and uh, the phase and amplitude of the signal. And what came out of this is the finding that the phase was rock stable, it didn't change for a minute. No one had ever guessed this. So uh, the phase of the noise was random. So if you stack the noise up, uh, then you got a gain of 10 log of the ratio of the time, you could do it. Okay? And that come out to be the order of 40 dB. So Ted was asked to give us 6 dB, and he came out with 36 dB. I mean, just amazing accomplishment. It was a complete shock to the community, and everybody was really surprised by this. Uh, and and uh, the did he next thing, the budget in his proposal. Oh, well, the budgets, the budgets were no <laughs> question. There was no, no, no problem with money. All you want, <laughs> time. I mean, you know, you had something this promising. Boy, things just took off. So this is a plot 
of the amplitude of the signal alarm scale. And it, it wasn't these dropouts were was a multi -crap. The sound was coming in the because it was so stable, it would cancel out. So all of a sudden, you get almost a zero signal. And this is a phase. Now, this is a phase it's racked up here because it only goes between plus and minus 180 degrees. So somebody had to go in there. We had a staff of people that could do this and unfold this, take up 180 degree jumps in there. And when they did that, they found the tides in there. And, 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 and no one had ever seen anything like this. And, and Steinberg was just stunned by it. That uh, this, is, this set his thinking off for the rest of his life about all he could ever talk about was a thing called acoustical oceanography. <laughs> and what this happened here is that, that you've got this sine wave of a period of days and a period of months. And you could see these, these uh, fortnightly and, and lunar periodicities in the data. And then periods of, and then the system would take data for a year. And we took the data for a year. We get these great big fluctuations there. At the time, they thought the Gulf Stream had fluctuations in the order of 50% or so. And we were seeing things that corresponded to it. So Steinberg focused on this, and I got to say, that at this point in his life, he was a little bit senile. He was up in his 80s, see. And uh, uh, his theory was this, that the, 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 the trail is it's geostrophic theory. The transport goes through like this, this is the core of the Gulf Stream. And that, the geostrophic balance causes the thermos lines to be tilted. And the tilted thermos lines change travel time across the straits. So as, so as, as the field accelerated, you'd see these things tilt down, and, and you know, you get this trail. And he couldn't talk about anything else. It's all he wanted to do. <laughs> so this is, I walked into this situation at the time. And uh, uh, this was very popular at the time, by the way. Admirals were coming down every couple of weeks for a briefing. And money was coming in. Uh, we had the Jaycees come down, which was a, a, a group from uh, a, a, a DARPA group that every year they would study. They said a study when they got one of the acoustics, mostly because of this result. And they're really interested in it. And Walter Monk and Stan Fortay, these are the top physicists of, uh, of the day. And, uh, and, and then uh, what developed out of this, a number of things. First of all, uh, Roger uh, Dash and Stan Fortay developed the uh, theories for the, the fluctuations along a single path. So they wanted to see single paths isolated, not the multipath. And Walter Monk and Carl Woods, the result of this, came out with ocean acoustic tomography, which was what Steinberg was, had been talking about. So I walked into this kind of a buzzsaw into this program. First of all, this guy Cronenberg was doing everything. Steinberg was a little senile. I wasn't even hardly able to keep track of what was going on. Cronenberg was running everything. He didn't have university credentials. He had a bachelor's degree. Okay. And he was running this whole program. He had about 30 people, what had 35 people reporting to him, doing this analog stuff on cables. We had our own boat. We were putting equipment in. And Steinberg would come to me and say, please, you've got to do this. Uh, uh, just got to explain it all. Just write a paper on this. Write a paper on this. <laughs> and then I met Birdsall, and I became very interested. He said, well, come down to Michigan. We've got these new things. It's a PDP-4 computer. And you can do this phase coherent demodulation. And we'll show you how to do it. Come down there and spend the summer with us. So uh, you know, I, I was uh, not well received uh, by Cronenberg. He said, we've made this discovery. I buy acoustic group, and don't expect to work on this transmission. We got some ambient noise data we'll give you. If you get some funding for that, uh, you can study that. So he didn't want, because <laughs> he was, Mo Conigo was worried, someone's gonna come in and, and replace him as head of this thing. And he, he didn't fit into the universe. So, so that was really was a, really was the whole concern here. And he was really running and doing an excellent job. I mean, these people were really good at what they did. So that's the story. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I started, I kind of do all three things. I wrote a paper in HQ on uh, this. First thing I had, I made this geostrophic calculation, and it was the order magnitude too small. Uh, this stuff wasn't right. But then I got some data from a guy named Saul Boyder, and he got the sound speed, he got the, some thermistor data, and I, I found out that was about the right of was. And I wrote a paper, JGU, one of these, I forget what it was now, and I said, look, uh, you can see the fluctuations uh, in, the, in, the, in the right order magnitude, and I put it into a ray model, and do some such production, and we can invert this. And, you know, First kind of a thing ever to be published about tomography. And I got back a, a review that said, the author does not seem to understand the important significance of his work. And he should, before he publishes, he should do the following. It lasted about two years of research to get this, <laughs> get this done, you know. So I, I, I just threw it in the drawer and I never did follow through on it. And I went by the first paper on, on tomography, which today I would probably be ashamed to have done. Uh, the next thing is I got. Two years of funding from the day, it was easy back then. I worked on ambient noise, like this guy suggested. So I kept myself funded for a couple of years. And then 
we're down there and spend a summer down there with Foot Nestor. Uh, nope. It's warming. <laughs> okay, you tell too much. And what this, what a little tiny computer, now we used to usually talk about gigabytes. This thing had 4,012 bit words, 10 to the minus 5 gigabytes. Okay, it was nothing. I mean, you probably use that like signing on to a computer. And the, the Cooley Tukey uh, Fortran uh, algorithm had just come out, fast Fourier transform. And the phase effect of modulation, the nice thing to do in there was the sampling. So I wrote a program that sampled the data on the clock so I get the phase of modulation, fed it into this FFT program there, but it took me three months to write. I had a Fortran program, I had to translate it back into the machine language, this little tiny structure. I mean, it was a, and you know, I was not an experienced program. That's all I did. And it ended up, I got a real time display up like this, and explained a lot about this. What this was, that was the carrier frequency, that was the frequency transmitted. And this was a surface wave frequency out here, side bands, plus and minus around the carrier. And then the second order side bands, I'll get seeds were heavy, the second order side bands came up. I published this stuff right away. And I got a huge response out of this. I mean, I can't tell you how much, uh, I can't tell you, I'm gonna tell you. Uh, first of all, these three guys show up on the underwater sound lab. Bill Ryder, Ben Crow, and Al Dow. Al Dow was an outstanding mathematician, he still is. And I've had the pleasure in the past uh, few years of working with his son, who was also an excellent mathematician. And what they had come up with was a model that was a Bragg reflection, that the, that the, the wave front would hit this, the surface waves, the ocean waves, and reflect off in a specular direction. And then the Bragg angles, which depend on the ratio of the wave lines and so on. And the Bragg ones, the specular ones unshifted in frequency. That was the carrier line. And these ones here were shifted by the frequency of the surface. They were spectral, the wave surface. So that really explained it away. It was a way to talk about it. And, and, it, and they were very excited about it. The next guy that showed up was a friend of Klaus's, Klaus Hasselman, a friend of Hans's, Klaus Hasselman. That's what the director of Max Planck Institute. He came in to visit Walter Dewey, and well, the last day he was here, once, oh, you ought to talk with this guy. He's doing some work on so I don't know what it is. And Klaus comes down, I show him this. And he had a theory of wave-wave interactions. First thing he said, give me a passport now, give me a passport now. I don't, I don't have it with you. He says, oh, we've got to give it to him. I have to go now, I have to go, but give me a passport. So I send him the passport and I'm insisting on it. And then I get an invitation from the German government to go over. And they provide the uh, 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 military transport to bring me over there. And I worked with him for a couple of weeks. And I brought two of the students back and they worked with me here in Miami for the summer. Uh, I got a wonderful response out of, out of close. And I got to talk to uh, Owen and I's sister to show this work to David Middleton. And uh, these two, David Middleton was a big active sonar guru. They always had problems with service waves. So I went through it, went out and spent a day with them. Went up to Princeton, spent a day with Dash, and spent a couple of days at Stanford. They wanted to separate out the single arrivals. A couple of years later, we get Nina Brzezinski here, shows up. He's a Russian, the head of the Russian Academy of Science, the head academic. And he, he's here, and he, he's with an entourage. The entourage is KGB. All these gorillas are around, walking around and stuff. You know? he, was a, he was a big acoustician. So and what he wanted to do when he was here is meet with me. So I'm in this little office up here in North Coast, and he comes up and he shoots these other guys away, closes the door, and he starts talking in perfect English. We talked for a couple hours. He made some measurements like this. He was really interested in it. And anyway, later on, I got to meet with a, a guy named Peterson, who was an uh, acoustician in this country, Ray Theorist. And I said, You know, I met Bukowski. I said, Nice to talk to him. He said, Yeah, I met him too. He said, We didn't speak English. I said, Sure, he does. No, no. He said, I talked to him for hours with a Trent Turker. <laughs> so they had some KGB guy to keep track of them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got enough prestige out of this work for what to uh, get me through what happened next. Okay. But first of all, I want to say a little bit. I want to uh, before I get into that, I want to talk about the academic program. Uh, at this time, the space program just put a man in the moon, it, and it was I wasn't going into it, but you know, talk around. I said it's going to be inner space was going to be the next big program, ocean engineering. We're going to investigate. We're going to investigate under the ocean. In fact, eight or ten companies built submersibles on this rumor, hoping to get in on this. That was a big plan. University of Miami didn't want to get out of it. Didn't want to settle this sleep. They proposed a a master's program in ocean engineering. And these were the people that they picked up that were already here. The ones in red uh, are all guys that were working with Steinberg. We had, a, we had, a, we had four options for master's program. Underwater acoustics, ocean measurements, 
uh, coastal processes. John Michel was the lead guy in that. He put the program, a small proposal on that staff. He got money to perform, to, to do this sort of thing. And I was a charter member of this group. We had a group down here, Marine Corrosion. And we set up an advertisement, a flyer, and I said, we've got 100 applicants within a, within a week. We were dying to get in on this thing. This was the word everything was going up. And we accepted 25. So now this thing is just roaring along, and we're, we're turning these students out. And then there's this big major upheaval. Okay. Uh, Steinberg retired. <coughs> University of Miami hired Scott Dobbin as chairman of the Ocean Energy Department and Division, which is a, a, a split up thing. And Scott Dobbin comes down here, and they try and insert him in on top of Cronengold to run this acoustics program. And Cronengold uh, takes the whole acoustics program out. Takes it up, owns a company, and moves it over to the Miami shipyard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Miami Vice. Yeah. So, so I didn't know anything about this. I didn't find everybody with me. I, I come in, I left the office Friday, come in Monday, up there was the second floor of Groves, left the floor of those Groves, and everything's gone. All the cables are cut, nothing in the laboratory. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the office by myself, and one of these guys walks by, he looks at, so we forgot this, and he takes a stapler off my desk. <laughs> 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 so, you know, uh, they. Uh, they never expected that I would be able ever with the time to do this stuff. You needed this kind of a staff of people. But what has happened? What's happened here is is this was the this was the you know the start of the digital revolution. Stuff was coming along, and I knew that I could do any of this stuff with a computer and and and, and let go of maybe ten of those people over there just to get that data off. They'd always be able to trace through it and do all this stuff. It took hours and hours to do it. Anyway, two years later, Scott Dobbin decides he's going to form an own, his own company, and Lee leaves too. So, Vietnam War absorbed all the funding that was promised for ocean engineering. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was uh, they had just started the development. And this big program we had with all these people now came down to this, okay? And I was the only one in this group, Cole Van Der Creek and John Wayne, Lee Craig, uh, who didn't last, like, he didn't get tenure, he was gone. Basically, it was three of us here. And I was the only one at tenure, so I'm automatically I'm after champ here by default. <laughs> so, plus the fact that now I got about 25 students in ocean acoustics. And I'm teaching two courses in propagation and one in single processing. I get 15% of my salary paid by the engineering school for doing this. And I, was, I turned out three or four master's students. I turned out four PhDs in this thing called the Interdepartmental PhD program. So, first thing I did as chairman here, I, was, is I, I hired two new faculty. In, in ocean acoustics. Uh, I was trying to hire a guy. I was at a meeting at the acoustical side and I was telling this guy about what a great place Miami was and all this stuff. You know, I'm trying to hire this guy, give him all the sales stuff, and he just turned me down. Fred Cappy was sitting there. And he came up to me after and said, I'd like to come to Miami. And I was just shocked. Fred had come up with this split step Fourier algorithm which replaced ray theory. It was a miraculous solution, a complete solution to the wave equation. Every, he was a star. He was, he was, everybody thought he was you know, great theorist, great theorist. And here he was, wanted to come down to Miami. So I hired him. At the time, I was chairman of an underwater acoustics committee uh, as part of the Acoustic Society of America. And I had to uh, come up with some metal, metal winners. They had a, a gold medal for a senior guy, a silver medal, and they had a bronze medal for, an under, for a graduate student. And I looked through this list of candidates, and this guy, Mike Brown, Really stood out to see. I mean, he was had, he was one of Walter Monk's students. Yeah, great. So I called up Walter and I said, "What's this guy going to do? Should I hire him?" And oh yeah, Walter was enthusiastic. And uh, Mike would never come here. For Tappy hadn't been. Was, people heard Tappy was here. They all wanted to come. Here. They were, this is going to be a great experience for him. So I got Mike Brown here. Not have to teach those courses anymore. And that was the that was the reason I wanted to. Do. <laughs> I got four. We had a wonderful program called the Interdepartmental PhD program. You, you, you appoint a committee, one guy in the math department if you wanted, and somebody in electrical engineering, and a guy in the physics department, and they would put together an agenda of courses for this guy, and they would do a thesis. And I could put four students through that. So I had a background now in putting PhD students out. So I wrote a proposal uh, to, for a PhD program at the College of Engineering. Put go on to this master, and they just turned it down. They they, they didn't want to have their name used and any, anything else than their own. Uh, so uh, I wrote a proposal, a couple of proposals, on I get some field capability, and I had the arrays, the, the computers. I had a way to do it without all these big installations, and uh, I, I was successful on that. And then I looked over and I checked our salaries. See everybody in the department, 
And uh, I checked it against guys at Woods Hole and at the University of Rhode Island. And, and I thought, God, we, we're way behind everybody. I went to Bill Hay with the, said, no, I can't possibly hire anybody here at the salary, but you gotta do something about this. And I, I kind of probably scared him. And uh, he backed out and he gave us all a 25% raise. You know, it was wonderful. <laughs> you know? So it made us competitive. And uh, I went to all the government laboratories and I went around and I told them, look, you get a student here who's got a master's degree, a good student, really work. You send him to Miami for nine, for not for nine, for a full year. I can get him through all the coursework. He said, go back to your lab and work with somebody there and do a thesis. So I started to get PhD students coming through this departmental PhD program. I'm just trying to build something up, you know? And that, that's the way things went. And then uh, Dean Hay was the dean at the time. He decided he wanted to build up the ocean program. He was appointed an outside committee. Now, if you're a faculty member here, you know that you don't have a career here unless you've got a source of funding somewhere. So you can think up all these wonderful things for some guy's supposed to do, but unless he's got a pile of money that he can go to and get funded, he's not going to have a successful life here. It's going to be miserable. So, this committee comes in, and, and when the outside committee says something, that's written in stone. You can't, you can't argue with it. So they had this, I don't even know who these guys were, but they come in here and they said, coastal process is the heart of ocean engineering. So hire a chair on coastal. But don't go acoustics program anymore. You've got too many people. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that was the greatest opportunity of all. Uh, naval architecture is a basic topic of ocean engineering. Hire somebody in naval architecture. And uh, there's a big sediment transport program underway at AOML. Hire a sediment transport person to work on. So, you know, we have to go along with this. We've got a wonderful guy as a chairman, Bernard Lamont. Yeah. Uh, he just graduated from Tetra Tech, he's an renowned guy, and he did an absolutely great job. And he went out, he hired Shen Wang, who's a naval architect, and Tok Yamamoto, sediment transport. Well, here's the way things came to pass from this. Uh, a week before Shen Wang got here, Stevens Institute announced, that was, and that, by the way, that's a leading school for naval architects in New Jersey. They announced that they were, they're discontinuing their program for lack of interest. The fellowship really was being done in the Orient. So we got this guy hired there. With, now, now he's got no possibility of, of getting funded. Yama, by the time Yamamoto gets here, he's delayed a few months. He gets here, knowing our, the, the, the program in sediment transport at AML has been canceled, stopped. <laughs> so, so he's here, and he was really anxious to have a career. And he, he just worked and worked and worked, and finally suggested to him, you know, go talk to uh, the people. And they're interested in shallow water acoustics and, and, and get geoacoustics, interaction of acoustics. Boy, they loved it. They had fun of the program. So the acoustic program grew despite, you know, the recommendations. And, and uh, 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 Bernardo the whole thing was able to keep these other two guys and John Wang funded, but there wasn't much opportunity in coastal process. There's no place you could go and get funded. A little bit of money at NSF. They gave Bernard a 60K contract. He tried to get a contract for John Wang, and they said, no, no, we're funding one of them. We can't fund any more than that. So there was no possibility of this, this plan ever working out. Things just sort of grew uh, like a weed, and uh, you, you, you go where there was water to keep it going. Bernard did a terrific job. He worked for two years on a, a PhD program, submitted it to Cope, and they turned it down. Uh, he was just disgusted. He called me in one day and said, Harry, take over as chairman again. I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm back in as, as chairman again. Okay, back to research. I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, okay, so the way this thing worked out, with all this discovery and meaning, Cronenberg took his group and they were going to do the old Miami Mimi experiment over and over again for years and years and years along a Sosa's path from Luthera to Birmingham. And I said, why don't you use M sequences, bird cells, get the past, past structure up. No, no, we'll do that next. First, we'll do this for a few years. And this was going to be their bread. Their, their, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, Walter, I mean, uh, Steinberg's idea turned out to be ocean acoustic tomography by, by Monk and Wunsch. And they, uh, no one could have had the prestige or the status of Walter Monk that could have pushed that thing forward like he did. Yeah. Because that was a huge, complicated thing to do to make kind of a simple measure of violent methods. And, and, and Walter, it went on for years and years and years. And these guys from Jason's started looking at fluctuations in a time varying ocean. And they didn't want to see multi path, they wanted to see uh, single pass. Well, the way to do that was to use this M sequence process and the bird saw that they right. I didn't come up with this, I used it my whole career. I got this from Ted. And what you could do, and, and really, this blank kid, he should have been Ted Birdsall. But Birdsall was in Michigan, he didn't have a field capability, he couldn't go out. And they, besides, they told him, get your processing in with Walter Muck and, and those guys, help him with the money program. So that's what he did. And I, I ended up filling in 
filling in this with the meager resources that I had at the time. So, uh, okay, what this M sequence, that's a little bit about these. These things have a perfect correlation property. You can send out this big long sequence and it correlate perfectly down to one pulse with no leakage at all. Miraculous, very, very clever thing. So you could, you could resolve a low level pulse in the presence of a high level pulse. You get a low level arrival next to a strong one, the leakage from the low to the high level one wouldn't cover. And uh, you could see single pass at very, very long ranges. And many applications of passive that and so on. And at uh, uh, some point, probabilist, see, all of the 6 1 basic community now come on this idea of fix a source or fix the receiver and look at what the effects of the ocean is. And the Navy did everything from, from, from with, with moving platforms. So they can't use any of this result. You know? And so my idea was to go ahead and show them, demonstrate to them that you could do this from a moving platform. I had reasons to believe you could. I didn't know for sure. So that's what I did. I put these M sequences on this. Uh... <clears throat> okay. Uh, I, I got a source in a computer, and a guy named Bob Tustin was, had worked with Scott Dobbin, and uh, he was a legend engineer. Scott uh, Dobbin kind of abandoned him, so I hired him on here to try and get an uh, end sequence that we in a source that we could tow. I wanted to demonstrate that you could do this from a moving source for active sonar for several other reasons. And the other, also, people made such a big fuss out of some out of this stuff when it was fixed, and now to see that you could actually use it. I mean, this was going to be a real uh, breakthrough of an idea. Now, we've designed a lot of sources since then, <laughs> and, and uh, one of them was this thing here. That's Neil Williams right there. You get some idea of the size of this. This is a multiple frequency source, 400 to I'll, I'll say more about it in a second. But a big hemi can 5,000 pounds out of air. And then we, we've got one right here, which was a little expendable one. It was three and a half inches diameter, it's about that long. And we've been out through the signal tube of a submarine. And it put out these M sequences. And the idea behind this one is you Drop, drop it out of the submarine. You're off the coast of North Korea. You don't want to know whether you're there. And they can't hear you because you're quiet. And this thing starts generating this low level M sequence. Now, if you know what the M sequence is, you can get 40 decibels a game. So you can see this signal way off. And so you drop this thing out at the bottom, and then you, you go on off and you listen to the signal, and you get a research quality transmission loss curve as a function of frame. So you know everything about their uh, propagation over in that site. And then this thing destroys itself, and you go home. No one knows you're there. I got I got some money to try this a couple times. Okay, so that's but in between time, well the first one, I don't have a picture of this thing. We had one source here, center frequency of four hundred hertz. And I wanted to I, I got I got a computer from Oregon. The next one was a Micron, it wasn't a deck, it was a Micron. I brought it over in the island of Bermuda. And we got a ship there called the Erline. And we had this source, it was kind of big, not as big as I one, but it was pretty big, one frequency. We couldn't get the the, the source had a uh, crane high enough to lift it onto the deck. So I said, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put some tires in the back of the ship, the airline, and we'll snug it up against the tires and put load binders on it, and then we'll lower it in the water, and then we'll lift it back up and bind it in again. And so we went off of Bermuda, and, and, and that's, that's how we, we got to do this. Uh, see, here's there's the island of Bermuda. We've got a social tiger phone to listen to, and there's the ship out there. Now, the only problem we had is... Uh, before we could put this thing over the side, somebody had to lay down on the deck and squeeze himself inside the apparatus between these pilings and stuff like that, and plug it in. And so Bob Tustin got down, he squirmed inside there, and just this boat was terrible and stable, and a wave hits the boat, and it moves over about six inches, and you can't get out. <laughs> you get stuck in there for hours. <laughs> and, and we can't, you know, yeah, move it, but it'll kill it. And, 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 and uh, you heard that string of profanity, a combination of <laughs> I mean, it was really upset. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just sitting there with our thumb and I'm out waiting to see what's going to happen. And the wave hits it from the other way, and who's back? And he skirts, he skirts out. <laughs> so, uh, what we're able to do is see, if you're calling this source, some of these rays hit the surface, and some are refracted. And uh, we got this, uh, this is the island of Bermuda, and there's this array over here. We're doing the receiving. We've got a computer there. And I was able to compute this thing called the scattering function. And what it showed you is the arrival coming in with this M sequence, okay? as a function of Doppler, which includes the speed of the boat, so you can see and know what the speed was, and then later arrivals coming in. Some of these hit at the surface, they had surface sidebands on them. No one ever seen anything like this before. I was really proud of it. It's the best piece of work I ever did. did everything we did. I go to the Coastal Society, and I get all set to give it. I got the abstract in there, and I get approached by the guy that was sponsoring Cronenberg. I can't let really give you this paper. 
Why not? Because it's classified. It's not classified. It's yes, you're using a social tiger phone. Yeah. So I don't tell them where it is. I don't tell anyone else. I don't do it. No, no. The uh, Russians might find out and go there and tear it up. Well, the truth was, I think, that they didn't want to see me do this. You know, they didn't want this out at the time. So anyway, I, I ended up, uh, I never did get to, to get that piece of work out. It's, uh, okay, so that's that. Now, since then I put together a team that could do these kinds of experiments. There was Ed Ewan, he got a master's degree with me in, in, in ocean engineering uh, early on. And he went to the University of Michigan. He worked with Bert Sullivan. He worked with the, with the with an excellent designer, Calida, digital designer, design circuitry, outstanding guy. John knows, knows about him, you know, really good. And uh, Neil Williams was a student also, got a PhD here. And Neil could uh, do mooring work in mechanical design, design pressure housing. And Michael Bozo, our uh, star heavy lifter here, did the did staging work and, and got everything together. And uh, you know, two of these guys are still here. Uh, Hen has, has since retired. Uh, and, uh, so we went on to do about 15 experiments for the Navy. Uh, Gold Company long since faded away. This was the Miami Sound Machine. What was nice about this is it, uh, uh, well, we get, it got nicknamed the Miami Sound Machine because of this Esteban thing that was around. And uh, that's how it was our call. <laughs> People would start calling it that. Uh, it it transmitted 100, 200 foot, 800, 600, 300 hertz, and uh, uh, had a 40 millisecond uh, pulse width and uh, 184 dB. And so we did, we used this maybe a dozen experiments all around the world, moored out there, transmitted for a month on the low duty cycle. And it just got, what it allowed you to do is look at this coherence as a function of frequency. Everything else was identical because you had the same pass, you know, the source was in the same location. We used that many times in the past. And then this other one right here. I've got a total of four Stuart proposals. Stuart is a small business set aside that you do with a company and uh, for classified stuff. See? And the, well, this is the results of one of them. This is a source that you can put out there and go 182 dB for uh, about 12 hours, and it would self-destruct. I'm still in contracts in, to do this, to work with this idea to the STTR program. Okay, second experiment, we did something in the ocean. Well, uh, this is the probably the you know, interesting. Walter Mump and, 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 and uh, 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 one, so Mump uh, and one, uh, uh, Peter Worcester. Uh, we're doing these experiments, deep ocean tomography. And they did they tried twice to do a, a reciprocal transmission experiment. Now they have a, a source and a source and receiver one point, so now you transmit both ways. In one case, the temperature changes are both positive, but the current changes, one is positive and one is negative. So if you add them together, subtract them rather, you get twice the, the amount of the, the current. So this is a way of measuring current, canceling out the temperature. <coughs> Worcester went out twice and tried to do this, and both times they had equipment for it, they could never make it work. These are six years apart, bigger experiments after a lot of planning. So I got approached by Noah. Now, the idea of what was going to happen in uh, Monk's theory on this was he and Peter Worcester were going to do these marvelous tomography experiments and show how this stuff works, and then AOML was going to do them routinely around the world to collect data from the ocean. It never came to pass, but that was. So AML, no, it was very interested in getting involved in this. They approached me and said, Can you do a tomography experiment? I said, sure, I don't have any equipment, but I give the equipment, I can do it. And so, well, we don't know what we want to do. It. We want to, they invited me down. I went down, they gave a couple of lectures and stuff. And then, and then I finally I went into Pete Rogers at ONR. And I said, I'd like to try and do reciprocal transmission in shallow water. The big advantage of doing it out here is the currents are really high. See, that's a very delicate measure in the open ocean. The integrated currents are pretty small. They were thick. So I talked to Peter Worcester. He said, look, if you can get those NOAA guys to come up with half, I'll come up with the other half. But it was a big risk. I mean, we are going to do this thing that generally couldn't be done. Hadn't put together a terrific system. We put it in on a, a seven-mile spacing out here, and we left it up for a month, and we got a beautiful reciprocal. Everything worked. We got to do this. But I had an extra set of batteries. I had a little extra ship time. So I took the instruments and threw them around, and we went out and put them out again at 22 kilometers up there, and it worked again. So it really establishes being able to do this kind of deep water stuff. It gives a reputation. Well, when I was going to spend some money on what we were doing. This was, they got two for one here on, on this experiment. Okay, so. And then we used this uh, big experiment. We got this thing in a, in a called yeah, Azrex. This was a surface reverberation experiment. And what we had to do, what we do is we bore this big source in here, and then we had a, a, a vertical array. Now, you know, that array looks up like this at the surface. And, and each beam in the array looks at a different angle. 
So when this thing goes off, paying a centigrade up, and we got the backscatter as a function of angle, you have a round of things. Great idea. We had a lot of trouble doing this thing. We were way behind schedule. People were suspicious that it had completely failed. And in fact, they had a, they called a panel in Washington to, to evaluate this. And the system I come up there, I just got everything together just in time for this panel. And I went up there and I gave a presentation for an hour. The head of the panel just looked around. And the room was full of people. They were expecting me to, you know, to get, get reamed out. And, uh, and they came to the panel and said, well, that was a true to force for the University of Miami. Congratulations. No one said a word. <laughs> <laughs> so Neil Williams analyzed this data for his thesis. And we were able to, we, we had a, an instrument on top. Well, here's the, here's the configuration of the mooring. Uh, uh, we got the mooring in 15,000 feet of water, 15,000 meters of water. I'm, I'm sorry. What am I saying? 1,500. 1,500 meters. Yeah, 1,500. We got the, the mooring. 30 meters below the surface, which means you have to know what the exact depth was out there. So what I found out is the bathymetry in the deep ocean has all been measured by the US Navy, and it's all highly classified. And, and, and the reason for that is, if you know the bathymetry, you know where you are. If you're a submarine, you don't have to come to the surface. See? Yeah. So I had to go to this guy, Marchand, and, and they, uh, they sent me was to get down this dungeon. I had to get all these permits and get down there. And he said, open up all these big drawers and everything, the whole ocean. And I said, here's where I think I want to put it. And he went in there and he wrote a number down on the paper. And that was the depth there. <laughs> so, and then when we made the boring, we had to count every shackle, measure everything under tension. You know, it was a major thing. And uh, David Farmer had a surface wave bubble maker machine that we, we put up on top. So that had to be at a certain depth. And we did it. We got it out there. We got this whole thing to work. And that was uh, ended up being uh, Neil Williams uh, dissertation. So these are a bunch of other stuff here. We we've, we've been just about everywhere. We did experiments under the ice, and we did experiments in the Mediterranean. We've done three or four straight to Florida. We went in the Gulf of Alaska, all around. Went one off of a couple off of Bermuda. Five or six of them looking at shallow water. I don't want to go through all these, but you, you, you get the idea. But uh, uh, meanwhile, Cronin Gold Company had uh, gone out of business. Uh, they had. Uh, they had one catastrophe is they, they decided they were going to put a thermistor string in to get long-term data about the sound speed profiles out there. And they decided to put a nuclear reactor power oh. supply. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. So this way, they could they could keep it running forever and they get five years of data. Well, it broke free. So now they've got a nuclear reactor floating around in the Bahamas, you know. The Navy's terrified to float up to some beach somewhere. And so the whole Navy fleet is out there looking for this thing. You know, that, did, that did not help them much, but there were other reasons why. They were still back in the analog age, and everything now was digital, so everybody could do what they could do in a morning. You know? uh, rise and fall of the flying marine physics. I was chairman again at the Lama Hotel, and the only way to get a PhD program is to leave the engineering school. They did not want us to use engineering in this thing. So, but if we come over here, we form a new division called Applied Marine Physics. Everybody had to discuss this and agree on it together. And, and uh, uh, that we could, uh, <clears throat> we could share an Erasmus degree granting program. And that's what we did. It was a terrific move. Another great uh, one of us, Alan Berman came about this time. And, and uh, uh, Alan really understood my concept of what we could do, and he was he had been the director of the Naval Research Laboratory for years and years. So he knew all the money supplies. He knew everything was possible. And, you know, he wasn't going to have to hire somebody in some field that didn't have any resources. He really understood. It. So things for the next ten years, things really grew well. The first first thing that happened, I got a phone call. Oh, we got this guy Graber. He's unhappy with which hall. He we want to expand his program. We're going to be happy. I said, yeah, I'll hire him. So there we are. <laughs> there, there was Hans. See? And uh, Hans, two Hans, we were able to get people like Mark Donald, Donald and Will Trent. And so we really started to develop some muscle in, in this field. These people came in here, and uh, uh, the thing started to expand. Everything was very well funded. The acoustics program, now with Yamamoto in there, and four or five of us that were in that, one year we got 25% of their basic research funding out of the place. And we really, really, things were really going good. And then there was a decline after that for number of reasons. This was a good time for us here. And, and uh, everything uh, was, was going along fine. And after about the next few years, a number of bad things happened. First of all, we had a number of untimely deaths in there. Fred Tapper passed away, and they, uh, Bernard and the whole day passed away. Richard Scott, and, and this guy, Tony, he's a young fat, he went there that long. He, he's exercising, and he's a heart attack and dies. So, and then uh, we had some retirements, and then uh, uh, the other, 
funding problems and stuff. Uh, the real problem, though, was after Berman left, there was no enthusiasm to rebuild this. He, he was the only guy who understood it. And the U.S. wanted to go on conventional fields. Now, the reason AFP was was like it was good for acoustics was multidisciplinary. Acoustics is basic classic physics, electrical engineering, and some mechanical engineering, translucent design oceanography. So it didn't really fit in any of those. But it, here it fit in. And there were other things. Hans's program was like that. And the stuff that these other people were doing here. Uh, 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 Mark Donald it fit in fine, and we really prospered in this thing. Everything grew. We got a lot of students. We were turning out, I think we turned out some 60 students in underwater acoustics graduate degrees through, through the year. So that was, that's when things started to decline. And the decline of acoustic, acoustics research in general came across the whole thing. The first thing, there were three things out here the Meat Protection Act, the demise of SOSIS, actually, this became uh, out of style, and the institutionalization of ONR. Let me give you a quick answer. This is the submarine, U.S. Navy submarine program it was quite in public. There's a Soviet submarines were up here, and that's one down here. That was about 30 or 40 dB difference. We were quiet at them. We had this terrific program. All of a sudden, they come up with this a cooler class submarine. It was quiet in the UK. And that because of the Walker spy case. This guy Walker was a, was a, was a, current, was a, was a warrant officer in the Navy. And he had access to all these files. And he started selling them information from our quieting program. And it's not like he made a lot of money. He got enough money to buy a little cottage on a lake and a sailboat. It was nothing. And he gave all this stuff away. They come up with this a cooler class quiet. Something that's quieter than anything that it's so quiet down there at 120 dB that it can go directly over a SOSIS array and not be heard. It was the end of SOSIS. Nothing. SOSIS couldn't do anything about that. This guy Walker, the the the, uh, the, the, the Russians called this the cooler class. That's the Russian word for shark. And the Americans called the Walker class. <laughs> so, so this guy ended up in prison, and he died a few years ago uh, in prison. So that sub SOSIS at this point is now being used to study whales. Whales made sounds the same frequency band as, as submarines, and they were a big uh, detriment to this. They, they were always trying to get rid of the whale sounds in there. Uh, so now they were, they're using it to track whales. That's all it's for. It's a huge facility sitting out there. Uh, being put to some, some use. Uh, second thing that came along was the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And, and this says that uh, the main thing was it's illegal to take a marine mammal. And the idea about a take, one of the way we think about it, you know, is Moby Dick. You bring a whale up on the deck and you cut it down and melt it down for oil. But this agency that's in charge of this thing uh, decides to, to uh, define take as, as the act of hunting and killing, which you are normally associated with it, capture and or harass by any, any of the mammal, and they define harassment by any act causing disruption of the behavior pattern. So, well, what happens next is this guy, Peter Tyak, from Pitts Hole, does an experiment along the coast of, of, of California, he's observing whales, and he puts a sound source out there, and he finds out that if the 120 dB CW tone, they detour their migration. And that stage changed the behavior. So the kinds of sound levels that we're used to, this is a decibel scale, see? A Navy sonar is toward 60 dB, and that's a 12 zeros after this uh, amplitude, you know? This is a big number. Uh, oil exploration air guns are 245 dB. And if you use these and you near a whale, you get fined $1,000 for this, and it'll take you the whale's fine. Some of the oil comes to pay $1,000, you have to pay them a million dollars a day, fines. So what's going on? And, the Miami Sound Machine put out 186. It was, you couldn't use that anymore. Well, you could use it, but you have to do it have an environmental impact statement. And basically, for the kinds of experiments that I did, uh, that doubled the cost. I couldn't really do it anymore. I couldn't go into the program manager some hot idea. I could measure this, and I could do this with these signals. And they would, they would say, OK, go ahead. Because now it cost more than double. Plus, it was a couple of years delay getting these things through. So that uh, only allowed for big experiments. And that's the next thing that happened in there is that the, these things that own our policy, 6-1, uh, they only want to do three experiments, one every year, and rotate around three-year cycle. So unless you were in one of these ones, and some of them are impossible to get on, the first one is going to be run by Scripps, going to be lead by Scripps, tomorrow so. They've done a tomorrow so every three years for the past 25 years or so. And, and uh, uh, then there was a shallow water, internal way, and geoacoustic experiment. That was mostly done by Woods Hole, by Jim Lynch. But I got in there because I had that nice source that everybody wanted to use. Okay, a big multiple frequency source. And then the high frequency program at the University of Washington. 
So I couldn't go into these guys and say, geez, I got an idea for this or that show to them. And uh, get, they get excited when you do it because uh, this, this is what they want. Well, they're still doing that today. They've got big programs, everybody. Uh, and so I've managed to go on for a number of years, but towards the end it got slow. And I ended up to make my living here towards the end. I, I was working on these SDTR and SDR. I've got about six of these things all in all. And the way these things are, a small business. You go in with them, like a partner with the university, you go in with some idea, and they'll give you 100K. But only 20K goes to the university. And the rest of it goes to this company. So it's kind of a lost leader. A lost leader. And I would go into these guys, and I have some idea, we're using M sequence to do this kind of experiment. And they go along, and we get, now, if you broke into this second kid, you got a lot of money. So, you got know, like I got like two or three of these. I've still got one in the works coming out. Three or four of my is total. You ever got into phase three, you know, it's just, then you had something the fleet was going to use. And we're close to that on a couple of them. We're still working on these things on the side, uh, trying to get something going. But the idea, unless you're one of the chosen few, and you're working up there, in fact, one of these guys, Jim Lynch, who was doing the same kind of stuff I was doing on, 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 uh, 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 stability of sound, shallow water, they cut this program out last year. So now, that only program that goes on in that six, in shallow water program is the geoacoustic interaction. It's all goes, all the money goes up, up to University of Texas. So things are declining. The money gets cut back. They don't produce anything, which you don't generally do. It is you don't do a big experiment with a bunch of participants unless you're pretty sure it's going to come out. You don't take a chance. So not much comes out of this stuff. Year after year, this tomography experiment one. The last acoustical side went to Carl Wunsch was there, and he said, tomography, tomography is really a bad idea. You really shouldn't do this anymore. <laughs> if you can believe it. Okay. So that, that, and Walter Monk has passed away, so I don't think you'll see any more tomography experiments. Okay, so anyway, uh, I don't know how long I've talked to you, but probably too long. Uh, May 31st was my 80th birthday. It was the last day of the last semester of my 50th year on the Rasmus Factory. <laughs> and it was my first day of retirement. So uh, uh, I'm still doing some work with the oil companies, trying to get them to use M sequences to drop their sound level down so they don't get these fines from these whales. I got a lot of I got a lot of consulting for years and years and just gave me money. I can do anything with my dollars they really were <laughs> interested in. I'm still working with them. And I'm still working on these stir programs trying to get something else. Anybody got any questions? Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's on the side. I did that. Uh, uh, second career for me is free diving. I got the, I got the nicest uh, review I ever got. A guy wrote a book about the, uh, uh, fish on sport fishing. He wrote a paragraph about watching me free dive. That was the most flattering thing I <laughs> ever got. Yeah. Huh. Do you see anything developing in, in acoustics research? Why anything coming down? You see any like? Changes coming in acoustics, anything coming down the pipe? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's worth hiring anybody acoustics. I think it's over. I think it's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, you got a white guy like Mike Brown, a lot of experience, that's getting a little bit of money from NSF, but you know, there's, there's no opportunity anymore. Uh, NSF, is get, the, the 6 1 program, get killed because the 6 2 guys who went there and said, Look, we I did for you. We did put this system. You got, you know, they, they pirate that money away. It's on a decline. And O&R, for many, many years, the top priority had 10, 10 items that they listed, the top priority, top priority was AS stuff. And that started to go down the list, and it has been on the list for the next, last 10 years. So a I, ASW is back. Is it really? But the thing is, we missed the boat with the other institutions getting into Kleidos. Oh. And, and using Kleidos as a mechanism to have more of a mobile listening source, you know, yeah. stuff. Look at the turbulence and so on. And that's what yeah, we that was a boat. But again, that goes back to no one at UM or Erasmus is willing to make an investment in yeah. programs. Hans has a very good point. A lot of times you hear about a guy doing a program and something to do with turbulence and, and acoustics. And all of a sudden that guy would disappear and he'd never publish anything again. You'd see him around. And what happened is the program went from 6-1 and transitioned to something called 6-2, which is applied and classified. Yeah. And some of these guys in the 6-2 program, one of them was the ones that measure turbulence in the ocean, you see. And you drag this device along and it senses turbulence, and that's where a submarine is been. So those guys have a huge amount of money. It's by Mike Gray about the University of Washington. 
that was one. Uh, Hans, I'll tell you another guy here, was uh, Rod Zyker, had a lot of money. And what he was able to do was detect hydrogen, self, uh, some molecule of hydrogen that came from the reactors. So for years he got money to study this stuff. So, you know, unless your program has got some kind of a, uh, and then there's, of course, there's the other thing, is this the, is the overriding Mansfield Amendment, which says all basic research should be funded by MSF. And so uh, Owen R was terrified to label something as basic research, because all of a sudden it'll disappear out of their budget. So a lot of stuff they do with this for, and one of them they have an understanding they will study acoustics in the sixth form. But that is declining. It's really on its way down. Uh, I'm sure if you come up with the right idea, and uh, I've been trying a lot of them, I've got some ideas, I've written papers on active sonar using dev sequences, show that it's absolutely 100% better than what they're using, but I can't get any support for it. Now, there's no, I mean, you're absolutely right, there's no, absolutely no investment here at all. Yeah. Uh, imaging from ambient sound, is that a thing? Uh, yes, it is, and Mike Brown got a big grant on that. And he, and they tried to go back and do it again, and it got turned down the second. I got an SF grant for three years. Imaging from ambient sound is an interesting thing, uh, and, it, and, it, and it works, and you can show that it works. The problem is, once you get Doppler involved, it falls apart. It doesn't work. So that's 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 the problem about it. Uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, but that's a there's people working on that. A lot of people. It's a hard field to get into now. There's people doing it for years and years and years. Basically, you're doing tomography with sources of opportunity. And, and uh, great idea. There's some, still some interesting stuff around. I'm saying it's a dead field. I think the big push of tomography is over. I don't think we'll see another tomography experiment. That thing is dead. Um, I don't know what I'd do now if I could make a living. You know, you, Hans is in on a lot of this classified stuff that goes on. So he knows what these things are. And there was possibilities in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in biology, you have classic. Passive acoustic monitoring, which is huge now, where you re record the biodiversity, and if you combine that with artificial intelligence, you can you can actually find the signature of different animals. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, there's probably a great things you lot of can do in bioacoustics. I don't know where the funding base is on that. Uh, there was a funding base for years ago because these animals blotted out certain sonar arrays, sosis arrays, certain times of the month. And they wanted to know who's doing it. They never did find out, I don't think. But anyway, I don't, yeah, you know, if you hear anything like that clear, talk to me, there's the possibility of doing this stuff. Do you still have the data from way back then when you say that you could hear all the fishes in? Uh, that data's long yeah. gone by now, God. That might not be hard to get. I mean, you could, you could put one of your moorings out there and record that stuff. It'd be a, it's an exciting area. You know, right, the first time we made sounds out there, they had a camera out there, and they had a transducer out here, and they started making this pseudo-random sound. In fact, they asked me, what do you want to, what do you want to make for sound? We want something that will attract, that will attract fish. I said, well, use one of these M sequences, because they were like pseudo-random noise. So I gave them one, and they turned this thing on, and the camera's there, and there's a transducer hanging. All of a sudden, this little speck, and this is just a go and go and go, and it's a shark, and he comes in and grabs a transducer. I mean, <laughs> 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 you can definitely trap sounds. Sharp sound. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Hans? Oh, yeah. Well, when the Navy or whoever it was told you that you couldn't publish a piece of research because uh, the Russians would be interested in Classified, yeah. Did they ever come back and say, it's okay now? No, no. So, so who, who, who gets the credit for the discovery? Does it, does it just percolate amongst the... Well, classified acoustics. I, I, no, no. I, I saw to it that everybody saw that data. Myself, people I knew would be interested. I mean, I went to O and R and I showed them this stuff. But you know, you never know. I mean, the stuff that got published. This guy Prokofsky is a Russian. He's over here asking questions about it. You know, <laughs> there was only questions they were interested. In. <laughs> yeah. Is is there any uh, hope in in the Chinese uh, Navy activities uh, sparking a new round of Navy funding? Yeah, I think there probably is. Yeah, I would doubt it a bit. Uh, but you know what's happened? Is I got invited to China, by the way, and I ended up giving uh, five lectures all in big cities there. And uh, they were really interested in acoustics. They are doing a terrific job. Uh, they used to send all their students, but we had a lot of Chinese students. We don't get them anymore. Because uh, they, uh, they're building their own academic programs, which is probably going to be so investing huge amounts of money, much more than in this country. 
We had a, a guy, uh, C.C. Chang, who was also the guy that liked my MC, was used them many times, had many discussions with him. He was the director of the Acoustics Code at Naval Research Laboratory for many, many years. All of a sudden, he goes back to China. I mean, the Navy was absolutely, uh, so, totally upset over this guy, excess to all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, the, the, this, this definitely going to be, uh, uh, what's going to happen in general is China is going to outstrip us. We used to get a lot of Chinese students here, and they're good students. I mean, they were all of them. Uh, but now they've got their own people over there, and they're, they're doing some terrific work and investing in it, which we're not doing here. They're going to be ahead of us on that. Okay, Thank thanks.